Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOCs course on Design and Implementation of Human Computer Interfaces, lecture number 20 where we are going to discuss about a case study on the concepts of DFD or data flow diagram and ERD or entity relationship diagram. Before we start, we will have a quick look at the interactive system development life cycle and where we stand. So, as you may recollect in an interactive system development life cycle, there are several stages. We have requirement analysis gathering and specification stage, requirement gathering analysis and specification stage. This is followed by a set of stages which form a cycle which is design, prototyping and early evaluation. These three stages together constitute a cycle design prototype evaluate cycle. Now here if you recollect we talk of design at two levels, one is design of the interface and interaction. For that particular design, we need to prototype and get it evaluated to understand usability issues. If after evaluation we find some issues, we may need to go for refinement of the design, then again we prototype, again evaluate and in this way it forms a cycle. Once we arrive at a stable interface design, then we go for implementation of the design first step of implementation is system design. So, design also implies system design. So, here with the name design we are actually referring to both interface design as well as system design. For system design of course, we do not require prototype and evaluation stages. So, once we arrive at a stable interface design we go for design of the system where we concentrate on modular design and there are several ways to express the design. As we mentioned earlier, broadly two such ways are there, one is function oriented approach, one is object oriented approach. In function oriented approach, we generally make use of DFT or data flow diagram and ERD or entity relationship diagrams to express our design. Once the design is available, we go for implementation through coding that is the next stage. Then we need to test the code program testing which follows the coding stage. After code testing, we get an executable system free from bugs. However, we still do not know about usability of the system which we evaluate in the next stage that is empirical study. After empirical study, we get to know of usability of the system. So, after this stage, we can expect a system that is executable as well as usable. This is followed by deployment and maintenance. So, these are the stages of an interactive system development life cycle and some of these stages form cycle that means they are repeated frequently and some should not be repeated frequently. In the previous lecture, we learned about in details the idea of DFD or data flow diagram and ER or entity relationship diagram. So, whatever we learned in the earlier lecture, we are going to learn it further in terms of one case study which we will discuss in this lecture. So, we will go through a case study in this lecture. First, let us introduce the case which we are continuing from the earlier part of the course that is a calendar app or calendar application. We have already introduced the app earlier and discussed other development life cycle stages with respect to this app. 
just to recollect what this app is all about. So, we are interested to build a calendar app which is primarily meant to be used by students to help in their various academic activities. So, that is the idea of the app. So, earlier we have seen how to create requirement specification document that is software requirement specification document or SRS for this app. So, as we discussed in the previous lecture, the starting point of our system design activity is the SRS document. From the SRS document, we start designing our system. So, let us have a quick look at the SRS that we have discussed for the calendar app in an earlier lecture, particularly lecture number 8, which we covered in week 3. So, we will just briefly go through the various requirements that we have identified for this app. If you recollect whenever we are trying to represent an SRS, first thing is it should be hierarchical for improved manageability of the code. So, we have created such, an, such a hierarchy. So, in the hierarchy, at the top level there are several requirements. One is display calendar under which comes three sub requirements or sub functions, display months display days with events and specific date view. Then we have another top level function which is set reminder under which there are sub functions create reminder, edit reminder and delete reminders. A third top level function is set background under which comes set theme and reset theme. Finally, there is a fourth level, fourth top level function that is synchronize under which comes attach account and remove account. So, here we will be showing only the hierarchy for quick recap. You must remember that this hierarchy is accompanied by a detailed description of each of these functions in the SRS in terms of their input, output, description and so on. Also note that in this particular SRS that we have seen only functional requirements are considered. If you may recollect earlier we also saw how to convert some non-functional requirements into functional requirements and add it to the hierarchy. However, here for simplicity we will be ignoring that part and we will be focusing only on the functional requirements. So, given this SRS, our intention is to come up with a design and express the system design in terms of a DFD or data flow diagram, which is a graphical language to express design ideas. Before we start discussing the DFD, let us quickly recap what we have learned about DFD. So, DFD represents flow of data through a process or a system. So, here the focus is on data movement between external entities and processes and between processes and data stores. So, our primary concern is how the data flows between different stakeholders of a system including external entity, processes and so here our main intention is to represent data flow between different components of a system and stakeholders that include external entities, processes and data stores. So, what are the components of a DFD or data flow diagram? So, we talked about few components, primary components, external entity which acts as source or sink of data, processes data stores and finally, the data flow. These are the primary components of any data flow diagram. 
So, how do we represent them? Remember that we mentioned about two conventions. So, you can follow either of those two. So, for external entity one convention tells you to represent the external entity with a rectangle having the name of the entity inscribed in it. In the other convention also same symbol is used. For process, for representation of process there is some difference. In one case we get one particular symbol with name inscribed inside it, in other case we get another notation. Data store also there is minor difference, an open ended rectangle in one case with identifier and name separated by a vertical bar, whereas in other case we have the open ended rectangle identifier name, but no vertical bar to separate them. For data flow, the notations used in both the cases are the same, an arrow with a label mentioning the name of the particular data. In both the cases we have the same symbol. So, you can use either of these set of symbols to represent different components of a DFT. Another important thing that we learned is about the levels. Remember that we emphasized on the point that design should be modular and hierarchical, so that it is easier to create and understand. So, DFT notations allow us to represent a system design in hierarchical manner as we have seen earlier. So, there should be at least three levels in the hierarchy, level 0 is called context diagram, level 1 is called overview diagram and level 2 is called detail diagram. Now, there can be level 3, 4, 5, any number as we want, all will be detail diagram. Too many levels of course, is not good and too few are also not good. So, we have to maintain some balance in the number of levels that we are going for. With that basic background and recap, let us now turn our attention to the case that is the calendar app and design of the app system and expressing it using DFT. So, we will start with level 0 or the context level diagram for the calendar app as shown in this figure. Now, here we will be using the second set of symbols that we have shown earlier with some modifications for ease in explaining the concepts. So, we will be using the level number here along with the name of the process separated by a horizontal line within a circle, although ideally we should use ellipse, but this is just to simplify the explanation. So, at the context level as we have seen earlier, there will be only one process. Now, this process encapsulates the whole system, everything in the system and the process interacts with an external entity. In this case, it is a student who are the primary users of the app and there is data flow between the entity and the process. Some goes from the entity to the process and some comes from the process to the entity. So, student can provide to the system data such as email account details, theme details calendar view details, reminder details or update set, delete events, date, time, information and so on. Similarly, system can send to the student information such as synchronization success or error messages, specific theme on display, requested calendar view 
and some uh, update set delete events date and time status. So, these are the things that can be sent to the student by the process and the process can in turn take input from the student. So, that is about level 0 or context level diagram. Then we come to level 1 which is an overview level. In this level we break down the single process that is there in context level representing the whole system and here we show the top level modules and their connection with each other along with data stores if they are there at this level. So, in level 1 we can see that we can have a process display calendar for the app. So, we have labeled it as 1.0 that is level 1 process. There are two data stores D1 and D2. D1 is about view details database and D2 is about event details database. Then we have the external entity shown here student and all the data flow that we have seen earlier with addition of data flow from data store to the process as shown here. From each data store to the process there is to and fro data flow that is in addition to the data flow between the process and the external entity, but this is not the only process in level 1. Let us see what other top level process can be there. So, earlier we saw display calendar process, now there can be another reminder settings process at the same level 1. Now, this process interacts with D2 event details database, but not with D1 view details database as well as it interacts with the external entity and the other process as shown in this figure. Are these the only two? Let us see. We can have another process. So, we have already seen display calendar, reminder settings, we can have a third top level process that is set background. Now, this process makes use of another data store D3 background details and it interacts with the data store in addition to its interaction with the external entity student in the form of data flow from and to the external entity. It also interacts with the other processes, particularly process 2 that is reminder setting. We can even add one more process, it should be numbered 4, process 4, account synchronization in addition to the other 3 processes display calendar, reminder settings and set background. Now, this process makes use of yet another data store that is D4 student details database. So, there are 4 data stores then view details, event details, background details and student details. Now, one thing you can note here is that these 2 data stores D1 and D2 have used one notation and the other two data stores D3 and D4 have used another notation where we are using the vertical bar to separate the identifier and name of the data stores. This is a other type of notation. So, we should never mix these things. So, ideally we should use either of these. This is just to show you that this mixing is not a good practice. So, in this case if we are following D1 and D2 data store convention, then this bar should not be there. So, in level 1 as you can see, we have now 4 
processes, these are top level processes. There are four data stores and there are data flow between the processes, between the processes and data stores and between the processes and the external entity that is the student. So, that is about level 1 or overview level. Now, we move to level 2 or detailed level. In this level, we detailed out the individual processes that we have shown in level 1. So, we start with process 1 of level 1. So, process 1 is display calendar. Now, we are showing the detailed design for this process in level 2. As you can see, here we can have two sub processes managing of calendar view and managing of events. One is given the identifier 1.1, other one is given the identifier 1.2 and they make use of the two databases D1 and D2, view details database and event details database. Note that here we will be using the terms databases and data stores interchangeably, they refer to more or less same concept from our point of view. Now, these two processes are interacting with the external entity student as well as the data stores. 1.2 interacts with data store 2, 1.1 interacts with data store 1. And there are inputs coming from second top level process P2.0 and output going to second top level process P2.0. That is process 1 level 2. Now, let us move to level 2 diagram for process 2 that is reminder setting. Here we have three sub processes or sub functions 2.1 create events reminder, 2.2 update events reminder and 2.3 remove events reminder. Now, 2.1 and 2.3 interact with the data stores same data store event details database. For simplicity, we have replicated the data store notation here, although that is not required. We could have simply used some arrows from this data store to 2.3. As usual, process 2.1 produces output which goes to process 1 and takes input from process 3. Process 2.2 produces output which goes to process 1. Process 2.3 produces output which goes to process 1. The three sub processes interact with the external entity as well as the data stores D2. Now, let us check the level 2 diagram of process 3 that is set background. It has got two sub processes 3.1 set theme and 3.2 reset theme. They make use of the data stores D1 and D2. So, like before they also interact with the external entity as well as the data stores. Process 3.1 produces some output which goes to process 1 and process 2 that is process 3.0 level 2. Finally, level 2 diagram for process 4 that is synchronization. Here we have two sub processes 4.1 add and link user email account with calendar activity and 4.2 remove or delink or edit email account with calendar activity. In fact, we can break it up further but for simplicity we just kept it restricted to two sub processes. Here we make use of D3 student details database, student external entity is present here. So, process 4.1 as well as 4.2 interacts with the external entity as you can see here through these data flow notations. They also interact with the data store 
and some input is coming to process 4.1 from process 1. So, that is level 2 detailed design of process 4. So, we have seen how we can convert the design idea namely the system design idea into a DFD using the notations that we have learned in the previous lecture. Now, one thing here you should always keep in mind is that what we have just seen is only one out of many possibilities. The same SRS which is the starting point of our system design process can be converted to different designs. So, there is no unique solution to the design problem and we can come up with different designs. Right now, we will not go into the comparative study of which design is good, which is bad. The design that you are likely to choose depends on your expertise, your skill as designer. So, if a skilled designer is there, then of course, he or she is capable of coming up with the most efficient design given the set of alternatives where the efficiency is measured in terms of manageability, resource utilization and such considerations. But the key thing that you should remember is that from the SRS we can get many designs what we have seen is not the only possible design there can be many other possibilities we have seen only one of many such alternative designs whether that is a good design or bad design we will not enter into that argument here. The other component that we have learned is the entity relationship diagram or ER diagram. What is the ER diagram? Let us quickly recap and then see how we can use this knowledge to represent the data stores that we have used in our DF diagram, data flow diagram for the calendar app. So, ER diagrams are generally used to represent data stores that we use in DF diagrams. So, they are used to express the rich internal structure, organization and relationships in the data stores. What are the basic components? There are three basic components. One is entity represented with a rectangle. This is an identifiable object or concept of significance. Then we have attributes represented with an ellipse, elliptic curve. This is a property of an entity or relationship. And finally, the concept of relationship which is represented with this symbol. Relationship refers to an association between entities, some connection which is represented with this symbol. So, with these notations we try to model a data store in terms of a collection of entities and the relationship among the entities. So, with that basic idea let us now quickly see how we can represent the data stores that we have just used in our data flow diagram using the notations of ER diagram. So, we have several data stores those we can represent as student entity, calendar view entity, calendar theme entity, event entity, reminder entity. So, these are all entities that we can think of for our data stores that we have used in our data flow diagram. Now, student entity has got some attributes like name, student ID and email of the student. Calendar view entity has got some attributes like view date attribute, view ID, view time. View date is a multi valued attribute having values such as year, month and date. Similarly, view time is a multi valued attribute with values that are hour, minute and second. Calendar theme 
the other entity has got three attributes id background and color now the calendar theme calendar view and student these three entities are related to each other with the relationship get the student can get calendar view or calendar theme so in that way they are related so this is not a binary relationship if you recollect it is a ternary relationship then there is this event entity and reminder entity event entity has got several attributes such as event end time event date event id description type start time and name of the event reminder entity has got several attributes schedule time description id reminder id as well as the event for which reminder is set is set to be set that id now event and reminder entities are connected through has relationship so event has reminder and reminder has event so both way it is applicable similarly the event entity and the student entity are connected through a relationship which is editing and assignment relationship so student can edit events and students can assign events or events can be assigned to students so both way they are applicable so both way arrows are there so in this way we can model the data stores that we have used in the data flow diagram one thing that may be noted here is that the data store levels or the rather names are not exactly the same as the names that we are using to represent entities relationships and attributes so that mismatch may be there however overall the kind of data that uh, that we are using in the data flow diagram is our main focus and that data we can model using the er diagram notations even if we need to use different levels for representing entities or relationships or attributes so in this example you can also see the idea of ternary relationships as well as multi valued attributes so with that we have come to the end of this lecture so in this lecture we try to learn the idea of dfd and erd in a better way in terms of one case study where the case is the calendar app that we are using throughout our course we have seen how to come up with level 0 diagram for the app level 1 level 1 or overview diagram for the app as well as level 2 or detailed diagrams for each of the top level modules or the processes that are part of level 1 diagram several data stores we have used in the dfd which we can model and represent using er diagram notations which we have also seen in this lecture that's all for this lecture i hope you enjoyed the material and you got a better understanding of the concepts of dfd and erd and how to use them in practice in the next lectures we will take up another way to go for system design that is object oriented design approach looking forward to meet you all in the next lecture thank you and goodbye Thank you.